conductive wire And you were so electric I had no say when you came so near And just passed right through me Hey everyone, welcome to Geekdom is Back. I'm your host, Deanna Chapman, and today I am joined once again by Jordan Clark, and today we are talking all about Giant Days. Jordan, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm I'm very excited because Giant Days is one of my all-time favorite books, and I'm just happy to get a chance to chat about it. So Yeah, it was one I had read like the first six or seven trades of apparently i was like going Uh back through my goodreads and i was like you know i have read quite a bit of this but i went ahead and just reread everything (laughs) before we did this podcast because it had been a minute and you know this is a book written by john allison with art largely by max Saren, but also lisa treman treman i'm not sure on that one i am the worst with names. So thankfully, yours is nice and easy for me. There's that at least. (laughs) But it's one of those comics that just can so instantly become a favorite because I kind of felt the same way when I read some of Lumberjanes, which Mm -hmm. obviously is a slightly different age group that's being targeted for that one, but it has very similar vibes in my opinion just like these friends being together all the time so you know i just kind of wanted to talk a little broadly about this one i think this is a comic that is probably a little more popular with comic book creators Mm. and maybe not as widely known would you agree with that i think so i mean i feel like giant days has become one of those books that like when somebody mentions it you know, it's that instant connection of like, mm-hmm. yes, like I see <laughs> a kindred spirit. I see, I see myself in you because like, it's, it's so interesting to think about the landscape of comics and also just kind of how, I don't know, like genre and stuff like that kind of like divvy up, you know, people's interest. Mm-hmm. And Giant Days is one of those books that doesn't really fall into a definitive place i mean i guess it's comedy i guess it's slice of life but like it is kind of doing a lot of different things and i equate it very much to a sitcom it's like reading a sitcom you know and it's like there's not really a lot of those out there in comics you know like even the books that you'll see that maybe are more like romance inclined are still kind of like in a science fiction realm or like a fantasy Mm -hmm. realm or you know something like that where they're trying to like rope people in with like some other genre trappings and this is literally just girls at university (laughs) and like that's the book (laughs) yeah yeah and it is so much fun though and you know i'm someone who largely reads a lot of superhero and horror comics especially as of late and I love Saga as well, which is one Mm -hmm. of those that's definitely like a genre thing, but it kind of falls into a different place than a lot of comics. And with Giant Days, it's just literally these girls living their lives. And, (laughs) you know, maybe some of it is a little exaggerated. You know, you get some wacky scenes here and there throughout the issues. But, you know, we have our main characters, Esther, Susan, and Daisy, They're Mm -hmm. three best friends. If you've ever seen best friends, you know, they're like the epitome of that. And then you have McGraw, who (laughs) it took me forever to realize that his first name was Graham because they just called him McGraw from the start. And then someone said Graham and I was like, who? (laughs) Who, Who's that? (laughs) And it finally clicked and you have Ed Gemmel and these characters are just so fun because... A lot of people are just trying to figure out what they want to do in yeah. college. It's kind of like that in-between phase. It's like, eh, you're an adult, but not really yet. Yeah. And Giant Days captures that so, so well. And obviously, I'm not nearly as familiar with the English school system, but it seems like they have three years of university, not four. Yeah. So we don't get quite as much time with them, but... yeah. It's still packed with so much stuff because, sure, it's not like packed with action scenes or anything, but you have these moments where things just get so out of hand that 
they go to these extremes to try and fix all of these problems they come across. And it's it's just so much fun. So what was it for you with Giant Days that really drew you in? Because 54 issues, and that's not counting, there's a couple extra trades like early registration and some other extra stuff. But the main series is 54 issues. That's a lot to yeah. convince someone to read. So mm-hmm. what was it for you that sort of hooked you and kept you going through the entire series? Well, back in the good old days of comiXology, when it was still a, a workable app that <laughs> would give you <laughs> little glimpses of you know different books, it was one of those books that they were just like, hey, do you want to read this? Like, here's a, you know, you can borrow this for free and check it out. And I just kind of took a chance on it. I never heard of any of the creators. I didn't know John Allison or you yeah. know, anybody else. And um, the first like couple of issues, I was just like, this is amazing. Like just the, <laughs> the, the level of uh, humor and banter between the group is one of those things where it's like, it's the perfect heightened kind of like, back and forth rhythm because obviously mm-hmm. like comic book dialogue and all fictional dialogue like people don't talk like that nobody's that witty nobody's <laughs> like you know like constantly coming back with the perfect like zingers or like responses to things but it felt at once the way that people do talk you know and like specifically girls of that age would talk and kind of have that back and forth because sometimes you know specifically with like younger characters people are apt to put like older references in their mouths or like have them kind of sound like, you know, I don't know. I'm not hanging around 20 year olds, but I (laughs) I know that they probably don't sound like that. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And this felt like very authentic and true, but also like each individual character had their own very from the, from basically the beginning. And part of that is that giant days was also like a, webcomic that John mm-hmm. Wilson was doing before it became, you know, a series at Boom. So he had some time to kind of establish these characters. But like everybody feels real, you know, off off the bat, you know, like Susan is kind of the the grumpy old lady <laughs> of the group. And Esther is like she's literally, literally in the first, I think, couple of pages. Like we, we learn about her her chaos field uh <laughs> and <laughs> just like the chaotic energy that she brings and and Daisy is the kind of the sweet, innocent, you know, one. But as they kind of grow, like those traits kind of intermingle between them where they all kind mm-hmm. of take on these different personalities. And so just like after I read the first trade, I was like, this is amazing. You know what I mean? There's not another comic like this. Um, and like I said, it feels very much like a sitcom in the way that you're able to sit down and like binge a whole season of community or like binge a mm-hmm. whole season of, you know, Parks and Recs. And like, it's got that kind of rhythm where each issue is a new setting, a new adventure. They go to Ikea. There's like, <laughs> you know, a, a school dance and, you know, all kinds of other things. But then, at the same time, you know, all of those relationships are building organically over time, you know, so like Susan and, and uh, McGraw's relationship and like the the ebbs and flows of that. And then, you know, Daisy and Ingrid's relationship and like, you know, all these other things that kind of pop up throughout where, um, you know, you're you're really in with these characters, you know, very quickly, like you're, you care about their friendship, you care about their relationships, you care about them possibly flunking out of school, <laughs> you know, all these other things. Um, so I think for me, yeah, I just kind of, I gave it a chance. I gave it a shot. And like very quickly, I was just like, I need, I need to read all of this at once. Yeah. I did still read it through Comixology somehow. I made it work. Yeah. You know, I was like, okay, I will borrow all 16 or 14 trades, whatever it is. You have a very lovely copy there. That no one can see, but I can see it. <laughs> yeah, this isn't good for for podcasts, but this is. They only released three of these, which is very yeah. disappointing. If you, I mean, you can't see me, but I'm holding up a a hardbound copy. They had these uh, not on the test editions, which are mm-hmm. like I think maybe two or so trades collected into one hardcover book, and then the back has like all the extras and the yeah, like reprints of the um the web comic and stuff. But like, I'm still holding out hope that one day we will get, I think we probably need two to three additional ones of these 
uh, to create the the final collection. But yeah, I mean, it's it's out there. It's accessible to read. And I think mm-hmm. that's the other thing is like, you know, with Comixology Unlimited, I think you can just read the whole thing. Yeah, that's exactly what I did. It's like six dollars a month to get Comixology Unlimited. And I just binged 50 plus issues of this. So it's certainly worth the money, in my opinion. And, you know, it's funny, because I'm not a big comedy person. Like, I rarely watch comedy TV shows, just because I host a Stephen King podcast. And for three (laughs) years straight, I was busy watching all of that stuff. And I am now like making my way through the rest of the James Bond movies, because these are the things Mm. that I frequently (laughs) watch. But this just hit different for some reason. And I really found myself just wanting to stay with the characters, yeah, which helped. And I was like, oh, you know what? Laughing is kind of fun. So (laughs) this was like a nice break from all of the dire stuff (laughs) that I usually read or watch, because there's hope and horror. For sure. Mm-hmm. But it, it's not necessarily f- funny. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's so hard to do comedy in comics, I think. It's one of those things that when you see people, it's either you got to be spot on, you know, with your dialogue, or um, you got to figure out, you know, the best way to kind of put that physical comedy or some of that into, um, you know, the, the panels and the action. But like, yeah, it's a, it's a spot on mix, right? Like between... <laughs> Just like some of the sharp, uh, like, like just back and forths that characters will have, or like just the facial expressions uh, that characters will make. Yeah. Um, I forget what what Daisy wanted. She wanted like two hundred and fifty like penny chews, and just like the, <laughs> the face that she made, where she was just like, "I'm just gonna chew them up." It's just like, oh god. So it's it's, I mean, even like. Um, I think there's a whole Twitter account that's just like out of context giant days. Mm. That's just like random giant days panels. That's I need like, to follow that because yeah. I follow a bunch of those out of context <laughs> yeah. accounts and I have not seen that one yet, but I imagine it's pretty great. And, you know, like I was saying, comedy is not a big thing for me, but this just struck the perfect balance because Mm -hmm. like you said the facial expressions the way the characters interact with each other and the fact that you have a good mix of characters who all get along like esther has no idea what she wants to do she's like the the liberal arts major that is just (laughs) like "Ah, i'll figure it out later and then you have susan who is very obviously going into medicine wants to be a doctor daisy while archaeology might not be the, the best path to take in the semi-present day, you know, this yeah. this comic isn't super recent, but it's one of those things where it's just such an eclectic mix of people. And then you have McGraw, who just, he needs to be a man and build things. Yes. But it's like, all these people are real people, too. Yeah. I think that's what really makes it work, is like, even though a lot of them are exaggerated and they get into a lot of exaggerated situations, like, you know Esther. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, you know, Susan, you know, Daisy, you know, these people, maybe not like a one to one, but you have people in your life that like, yeah, you're you're kind of a Daisy, you're kind of a, <laughs> you know, you're kind of a Susan, like you're somebody that, you know, I'm, I'm a Susan, I feel like a Susan, she's the <laughs> character that I related to the most. But it's, it's tricky to do that, right? To like, have a, a certain level of grounding in your characters, where even though they're getting into ridiculous situations, like, Susan's going home to a town full of enemies of people who are like <laughs> out to get her and you know like all of this other wild stuff but like it works because they feel real and like no matter mm-hmm. how cartoony they get you know no matter how many devils and angels are on Esther's you know shoulder like goading her into doing things like it feels like they're still tangible people you know and yeah. so like if they were just crazy broad stroke kind of characters that were like very literal archetypes of like the fun one the you know stuck up one the you know innocent one like it kind of would be more like eh, okay like this is fine you know maybe yeah but the fact that you're you really care about 
them and the ups and downs that they go through, whether it's, you know, school related or relationship related or, you know, family related, like you're always just like, oh, but I want, the, I want the best <laughs> for all of you. I want good things to happen to you. Yeah. And just the way they feed off of each other too. You can tell the difference between when, for example, Susan and Daisy are together. And then when mm -hmm. Susan and Esther mm -hmm. are together, it's like, you have to know how to handle each person in their own way to get through yeah. to them like when daisy goes all it goth whatever she mm -hmm. did you know yeah. and they just had to find a way to get through to her and yeah they each had you know this deep understanding of who daisy is in order to do that and you mentioned the thing like we all have friends like this it might not be one-to-one -one. and i was texting some of my friends while i was reading through this i was like you need to read this i was like this is you you need to go read this <laughs> and it's funny because you don't necessarily get that with like the superhero comics because Yes, you can have grounded superheroes, but it's just not the same because they're doing all of these things that would never really happen. But just like going to college, that's a perfectly normal thing. Yeah. And them going through all of these relationships and the whole whirlwind of Daisy and Ingrid and, you know, Esther and Susan not liking Ingrid and mm -hmm. <laughs> for good reason. She's, yeah. <laughs> she's a wild child. Yeah. That's for sure, to say the least. And just the way that they work through that as friends. And even when you get sort of those, I guess you could call them like post credit scenes almost where it's they jump into the future. And it's like one year later. Yeah. And Esther's only made it to two of the monthly reunions out of 12. And she's just like, I work so much, I can't think. And I was like, Oh, that's, that's me. I, yeah. I just like, dive into my podcasts. And then I'm like, what day is it? What is yeah. happening? Who's out there? <laughs> yeah, well, because I, I think that's also just like, you know, you get the university stuff, but then you get little glimpses of, of their home life, you know what I mean? And even, mm -hmm. you know, getting into Daisy's backstory about, you know, her losing her parents or uh, getting into meet Esther's <laughs> parents and, you know, them finally deciding they're going to cut her off or, you know, even, you know, Susan's family, which is like a whole mix of everything, you know, she's got <laughs> yeah. six sisters. The caravan. You know, yeah, her, her dad's living out in the caravan, like... um you know, it all feels again like, oh yeah, I've 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 got friends who you know like will go over to their house, and you're just like, wow, there's a lot happening here. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. and I think that again kind of fills in uh, a lot of the gaps. And even like you were saying before, like having those those weird interchangeable character mashups, like that's a, again a very sitcom situation where it's mm -hmm. just like. Well, now, now we're going to see Ed and Daisy together, you know, which is something that we, we haven't seen before. And now we're going to see, you know, uh, McGraw and Esther together, you know, and like what that relationship is like. And even kind of how quickly, you know, like the first issue, you kind of see that they've just all, they're all on the same floor. They've all kind of like met each other very briefly and they've really formed this bond in this relationship. And even, you know, in college where it's just kind of like, yeah, like, there's no reason that we were friends other than we just bumped into each other, you know, randomly yeah. at the library or whatever. And like, now we're friends for life. And it's just kind of like those weird circumstances of, you know, these people kind of getting roped into your life and very similar high school, college, like that time in your life feels very pertinent. Like everything that's happening is like heightened to 11, Yep. you know, cause you're just like the, what's happening now is the most important thing that's ever happened to me in my life. And like, you know, like, past this moment i don't know if i'm going to be able to it's just kind of like the dramatics you know <laughs> sometimes yeah. like when they all got sick uh and they're just like yep we're just gonna give it up I'm like we're all gonna die <laughs> here. Um, yeah or even daisy sort of struggling with her identity mm -hmm. towards the beginning and you know we see her and she just like kisses ed <laughs> and yeah. no one was expecting it and she was like okay <laughs> <laughs> That happened. We don't need to discuss it. But it's nice to see that kind of character development, too. I think yeah. you, know, you, you mentioned that it's 54 issues, but it, it really gives you time to sit with them and watch them grow over that period of time, you know, and it, it has, again, comics and sitcoms do have a, a bit of shared DNA in that, you know, when you're reading these stories, there's a level of like expected comfort and characters don't really change, you know, mm -hmm. like that you're supposed to come back 
you come back to friends, you know, each episode and like, no, no nothing has radically changed. You know what I mean? Right. Like some of them may be in a relationship or, you know, maybe they got a new job, but fundamentally they are always going to be the same characters. And with giant days, you are getting a little bit of like, Oh, but like, yeah, I didn't think Daisy would do that. Or like <laughs> Esther, like that was an interesting choice, you know, like even, um, you know, like the, I mean, I, I don't know how deep we want to get into things, you know, kind of sp- spoily, you know, situations, but like... I think we can get our feet wet in some spoilers. This has been out for a while. Yeah. And even if we talk about certain things, you truly do not get like the whole picture without just reading this whole thing because so much happens. But so please go ahead. Well, I mean, even just like, you know, the fallout of the McGraw, Amelia, Esther, mm-hmm. Susan <laughs> relationship <laughs> where... You know, I, I there's there's a kindness to this book that I think you also don't get in a lot of just media in general. Like it's yeah. like people are nice to each other, and like even when they do the wrong thing or hurtful things to other people, like they feel bad about it and want to work it out. You know, yeah. in in a way that sure is probably. That's, you know, fiction is nice in the way that, you know, there's loose ends get tidied up and people forgive each other and, you know, move on and do whatever. But, um, you know, it still feels nice to see characters who are genuinely concerned about each other and other people and like mm-hmm. want to be good people, you know, even if sometimes they're a little chaotic or a little, you know, they're, they're, they're with the tunnel vision, like, um, you know, when Susan is, is trying to run that Manchurian candidate in the student elections, you know, kind of <laughs> torpedoes her relationship because she's so yeah. focused on, you know, doing this one thing and like she's stretching herself in so many different directions. But like, you know, the the then ownership at the end of it where it's just like, oh, yeah, I did. I screwed that up. <laughs> that was me. Like, that wasn't. Yeah. I'm not going to blame other people for, you know, my mistakes. But then also like her friends are like there for her you know like it's very Mm -hmm. affecting you know to kind of see um you know those kind of bonds you know and make you think about like man i wish i had friends like daisy and (laughs) and susan (laughs) no matter what i no matter how much i screw up or how how big i i kind of you know swing and miss like you know there's people that are going to be there for me to support me you know and and give me that unconditional love and support so it's it's nice to see characters like that you know when you kind of don't see them so much in a lot of stories yeah that is definitely true there are some comics out there that are just like completely ruthless (laughs) with everything that happens and you know like i said as someone who reads a lot of horror that's pretty common so you know it's like oh you're you're gone. You're dead. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> Which we don't have to worry about in giant yeah. days, really. But I mean, there is some death, but <laughs> it's kind of not the main part of the story. Yeah. But you know, like McGraw loses his dad. And mm-hmm. it's just they are all going through life together. And, you know, we even get some little fun side stories that maybe weren't the most necessary but you know like ed going to australia yeah yeah. it was just a fun little side thing for him Mm -hmm. and because ed isn't one of the characters we're spending a ton of time with earlier in the series it was nice to get that from his character and just sort of see him working through you know basically getting over esther because he has this massive crush on her and Mm -hmm. then falls off a wall because he's drunk and tells her that he loved her and uh, poor boy (laughs) poor ed yeah but that's the thing too i mean like even some of the side characters you know feel Mm -hmm. feel not like side characters in the sense of like they're non-essential you know because ed pops up a lot you know he's Helpful sometimes, not helpful other times. <laughs> you know what I mean? He gets Esther uh, in, enrolled in a in a fraudulent paper scam, and like uh, also <laughs> gets McGraw more or less like entwined with uh, who I'm forgetting their name, but their their roommate Dean. Uh, Dean, yeah, like he Dean kind of runs over their life for yep. <laughs> a majority of the story, but. I get, I mean, Ed, Ed feels very real too. Like, you know, somebody who is very self-conscious about himself and very much so like is trying to figure out 
you know, in a, in a, in a world, you know, in a university where there's sports lads and, you know, even, you know, folks like McGraw who are like manly men, he doesn't really fit <laughs> into that archetype, you know, it's just like, I want to have the college fun too, you know, <laughs> go on dates and like, uh, you know, feel like I'm, I'm part of, you know, what's happening, but like, it's not even that he's not like that. He's just like, I don't know who I am, you know, to the extent that I feel comfortable existing as, you know, Ed Gimmel, you know, until, you know, later on in the story. And so I think he's he's another character that very easily could have just been, you know, the other friend yeah. that they, they call on sometimes. But, you know, he's very, very much so a essential part of that friend group because you see everybody like meets up with ed i mean like mm-hmm. everybody has a story with ed susan esther daisy like they all kind of like even <laughs> even when daisy watches too much friday night lights and uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was so good and ed comes to her to like get counseled you know and like uh <laughs> get over esther it's just kind of like yeah like he is somebody who is very much in that friend group, you know, as much as anybody else. And I think that's, you know, another thing sometimes like community would make the joke, you know, that the study mm-hmm. group was kind of like the entire school, you know, and like <laughs> nobody else <laughs> really existed outside of them. And yeah. I think this feels a little bit more true to life where, you know, every once in a while, you'll kind of get glimpses of like, oh, yeah, I guess they do have other friends that they hang out with that like people that they know that will kind of come and go or like briefly show up or like, strange rivals in, <laughs> you know, yeah. in classes or just on campus that they're just, you know, just like, oh yeah, that's, that is another real feeling of just like, you know, even if this person is not necessarily somebody that I am competing with, like you've built it up in your mind that like, we've got, we've got a, a thing going on, you know? And like, um, yeah, it's just, it's just another layer of everything where you have all these characters interacting in a in a in a world that feels real because like the campus itself like again i don't know much about english university but like (laughs) you know it seems like it seems like you're getting your standard experience you know they're going out to pubs a lot and um you know like they're all of their classes seem very much so like what i (laughs) expect yeah you know with the big lecture halls so yeah i mean i i i can't praise it enough just in terms of of that balance of like Kind of like I, I would almost venture to call it realism in the sense of like I, I feel all of these things and like know all of these things from a like a firsthand perspective. But then you know, kind of blowing it up, you know, like when they go to the music festival or like uh, some of their other misadventures, where you're just like this is embellished and exaggerated, but like also <laughs> like <laughs> feels like a thing that you would get into with your friends. Yeah, and you mentioned earlier how you sort of have these different pairings, like we were saying, Susan and Daisy, Susan and Esther. And I love that John Allison gave these characters like their own little things. And like, Susan never really gets jealous when McGraw is off with Daisy or Esther. She jokes about Esther kind of being trouble. Like, I Mm -hmm. don't like this. I don't like you two together. But then like Daisy and McGraw, Daisy just destroys everyone at pool. And that's kind of the thing they do together. And I think at one point they play darts too. And he's like, oh, no this hurts me (laughs) so just the fact that they have that little thing together and it's not like blown up by susan or anything the fact that those three trust each other so much that you know it's fine if daisy and mcgraw go off and play pool and beat all the the big sports boys at (laughs) pool to try and win some money and then have to leave anyway (laughs) yeah well i think that's the thing like susan in the in the beginning where she's once again, secretly dating McGraw. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, you know, he's like, why do you never bring me around your friends? And she's just like, I've never had friends like these before. Like, I don't want to ruin it. Like, a lot of my friendships, you know, just, like, I just torpedo them somehow. And, like, these are very special people to me, you Mm -hmm. know, and you really get the sense of that, that she does trust them and, like, really want to be around them, you know, more than anybody else. And, like, it's not, it's not a, it's not a weird symbiotic relationship where they're yeah. like they don't fall into some weird codependency you know situation but it's more just like an authentic we get along you know like we have an understanding this is somebody who who knows that i'm never going to clean my laptop and they're <laughs> fine with that <laughs> they're they're willing to live with that um 
you know, each each of them have their own kind of weird oddities that, yeah. um, you know, I think, you know, the more you get to know somebody, the more you're like, yeah, that's just, that's just Esther, you know? Yep. <laughs> uh, even um, all her different boy exploits, you know, where they're kind of just watching from the side. She dates a, like, a assistant professor. Mm-hmm. She dates, like, a guy who's making really bad films. She dates a guy who uh, is, like, a like a protester activist and Mm -hmm. like um, many more people. But in each time they're like, yeah, he's bad. He's terrible. Like, you know, (laughs) Daisy and Susan are just kind of like waiting for this to blow over. Uh, (laughs) But yeah, again, it's just like, yeah, you know, we, we support your bad decisions. Uh, (laughs) We wish you would make better decisions, but. (laughs) (laughs) Which is exactly what Esther and Susan did when Daisy was dating Ingrid. But that, eventually crossed a line where they were like, we cannot yeah. let this carry on. <laughs> yeah, to do better, yeah. And even just like living with people, you know, like I think that's another thing I'm sure, you know, a lot of people have experienced where it's just like, oh, my best friends, like it'll be great if we all live in a house together. And then you live in a house together and you're like, oh, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> I didn't know that's what you did in the bathroom. Like I, <laughs> I didn't know <laughs> – <laughs> that, you know, you don't clean up after you finish cooking or, you know, like all these other little things where you're just yeah. kind of like, oh, this is not necessarily what I thought this was going to be, <laughs> you know, like, it was, wouldn't it be fun to live with each other 24-7? And then you're just like, ooh, I need some space. I need to get yeah. out of this house. <laughs> yeah, it certainly is one of the most fun things I've read in a while, though. And it hit me kind of like when I read why the last man it just like instantly became a favorite of mine and obviously why the last man very different in tone but still Mm -hmm. has its comedic moments it certainly has some comedy in there but it's not quite as comedic as this and i was literally just sitting reading this on my ipad and just like laughing to myself half the time yeah i think that's i I don't know how many comics I read that genuinely just make me like stop because I'm laughing so much. Like I have to like take a mm-hmm. break. <laughs> yeah. You're like, I cannot read and laugh at the same time. <laughs> yeah. And you know, like, sure. Like there's a lot of books that aren't like actively trying to be funny or not, you know, especially steeped in comedy. Um, but I mean, even just thinking like, mm-hmm. you know, Squirrel Girl maybe was the last one that I was like, yeah, this is like legitimately great one. funny. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like every issue is like legitimately, there's a hilarious joke or something set up in here. And even <laughs> just weird stuff, right? Like when they're looking for houses and that one guy just looks like Super Mario and you're just like, what? <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> like Why? <laughs> A lot of just like visual jokes and cues and, you know, just the reactions to things. And again, like the, the, the level of banter, you know, to a point where it doesn't feel like forced or like, you know, these jokes are, are kind of, cause everybody's got their own comedic style, even like Esther loves a bad pun, you know, like she mm-hmm. tries to fit them in as much as possible. <laughs> and like some of them are legitimately great and some of them are legitimately bad. <laughs> and I think that's what makes it such a joy. And like, you know, Susan's, uh, you know, penchant for either just get going real dark or like <laughs> going real, just real, real sarcastic. And like, mm-hmm. uh, Daisy's just like innocent questions or even like, <laughs> I think my thing is my favorite joke is still in one of the early issues where Esther is going to go and like box to like get her mind off stuff. And mm-hmm. she asked Daisy to come and Daisy's like, I don't know. Like if I get a taste for it, I might want to kill. Like, I, might, like <laughs> I don't want to cross that line. So good. <laughs> And you're just like, Daisy, come on. That's a bit much, Daisy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but still, there's stuff like that where it's just like, you know, they, they, they really do bounce off each other well. You know, like if you've ever been around or had friends where it's just kind of like you've got your own in-jokes, you've got your own kind of like, you know, callbacks and you, you, you kind of vibe and bounce off each other really well. Like it feels a, like a very honest, fluid, you know, interaction between them all where it's not just like john allison has set everybody up to be a joke machine uh and everybody's you know kind of spouting off jokes you know one at a time as much as it's just like yeah this like these conversations feel real but are also like hilarious and like these situations feel grounded a bit but also are like very funny like the way that they all kind of 
you know, navigate all the, all the, just <laughs> the craziness of university, but also the craziness of your, your early twenties, you know? Yeah. And the way the three of them just tease each other all mm-hmm. the time too. I think that is very accurate when you get clo- that close to people. And yeah. honestly, all of giant days just feels like you're hanging out with friends. Yeah. And sometimes that's just, that's all you need in a comic. You don't need anyone saving the day. Yeah. Although you do have a little bit of that when they come to each other's rescue. Yeah. And, you know, one last thing I wanted to be sure to mention was the fact that Esther ends up working in a comic book shop. <laughs> yeah. Because Well, she works in a in a sausage roll <laughs> shop, which I was not I was not aware that was a thing. I guess that is because yeah. it's also seemingly a bakery. Yeah. That was kind of weird. So I guess maybe they have savory things. <laughs> I man, when that dude was sucking the custard out of that donut, <laughs> <laughs> that was so sad. But then Esther does it like two pages later, so maybe yeah. there's something to it. Maybe that's what. Maybe I should try that. Yeah, maybe. But she ends up working at a comic book shop, and it's kind of like the job that sticks the longest throughout the run. Mm-hmm. And you can tell that sure she is someone who kind of bounces around jobs a lot. Like we all have that friend who is just like always ending up getting a new job because they don't, they either get fired or don't like the one they have. Mm -hmm. So they just kind of move around a lot. And Esther kind of finally finds her place at a comic book shop, which I don't think anyone would have expected for her, but I just loved it so much. Yeah. Well, it's, it's weird because even like throughout, like at one point, they're on the couch walking, watching Attack on Titan. And like, I think there's other, like she buys a robot comic mm-hmm. and it's like, just like really into it. Like she's got weird like <laughs> penchants for, um, you know, I mean, it seems like she's into manga and anime, like legitimately, but also like is open to, you know, like comics and other stuff like that, even though <laughs> that one. Where she gets the job and like she has to answer that series of questions of like, you know, how did Daredevil <laughs> get his powers? And she was like simultaneously poked in the eyes at the same time. Or <laughs> like... She knows nothing about superheroes. <laughs> it's so great. And I think someone says something like Spider-Man got her a card at the end or something like that. Yeah. Comics code authority card and she's like oh i love the man of steel (laughs) (laughs) so fantastic yeah well i will say too i mean one thing we didn't get to talk about yet but i think is really important and really interesting about this book is that like a book like this because it is it's a boombox book and boombox it was like an original boombox book and like a lot of those books generally are geared probably towards a younger ish audience you know yeah and this book is like not for kids <laughs> but also <Definitely> not. <laughs> uh isn't like mm-hmm. raunchy necessarily or anything like that but it feels like it, it sits in a place where a lot of comics don't which i think is interesting where it's like a, tr- a true young adults book like it is very much so aimed at people the same age as the characters you know what i mean like in their early to mid 20s where like it's not even just relatable but like you know there's they <laughs> yeah. take drugs you know numerous times throughout the stories and like there's a lot of you know them either having sex or like intimating at it and it's again not done in a way that's like crass or like um you know really like takes you out of the story or throws you off but again in a very natural kind of way like there's a lot of teasing like you know ed gets numerous instances where like you know the first time where he has a hookup with that uh older woman at the the newspaper yeah and you know that doesn't end well for him and he kind of becomes like the butt of a joke but then he hooks up with esther's friend who's you know visiting and like then it's kind of like oh that's a nice thing that happens Mm -hmm. you know what i mean but like sex isn't done in a way that it's either like it it's used in a variety of ways which i find pretty interesting because some of it is for comical effects some of it is for 
dramatic effects like when you find out that people are hooking up and you're like "Ooh, <laughs> that's maybe not good <laughs> or like S- susan's look of horror on her face when she wakes up at a- after that first night with mcgraw yeah. that we get to see and she's just like oh no <laughs> it happened <laughs> you know there's a lot of that and it's not i think that's it's it's done in a real i, I guess the best way to describe it like a healthy way because like mm-hmm. even them like you know, when Daisy has her first kind of, you know, hook up, like, it's not done in a way that's like, ooh, Daisy, but also it is kind of like, ooh, Daisy, like they, when she, <laughs> when she uh, comes out of the room with Ingrid and Esther's kind of like, oh, <laughs> like I never. <laughs> and, and then a few issues later, I think Esther walks in on them and she's like, oh, no, <laughs> I gotta go. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it feels again, just kind of like a real healthy, like fun kind of thing between them all where they're not like because even like you know ed like they're not they're the group you know Mm -hmm. uh daisy susan and esther like they're not teasing him about it you know what i mean like they're kind of like at first they kind of are but once they realize that he's really upset about it like they're not you know pushing that but like Mm -hmm. other times they are kind of like you know teasing each other about like oh like esther are you gonna go hook up with that you know (laughs) like but it's never in like a shaming kind of way. Yeah. Like it's all very positive and all Mm -hmm. like, again, very refreshing. I think when you think about, you know, a story about, you know, three girls, you know, in college, like all of these things, you know, like the, the hookups and the drinking and the drugs and Susan's long suffering smoking problem (laughs) and like all this other stuff isn't done in a way that, yeah, feels like, you know, John Allison's like wagging a finger or like, um, you know, also just like again strangely weird and inauthentic but it's it's also very much like just another part of their lives like another part of like you know just their everyday day-to-day daily lives and like even when daisy uh takes like all three of those pills in the bathroom during her birthday (laughs) and like uh, (laughs) just is 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 losing it you know it's not just like and that's what happens when you do drugs kids it's more just like yeah like she had a weird trip yeah <laughs> like that is what happens you know <laughs> or anytime susan has to run or go up the hills mm, and she's boy. just absolutely dying because her yeah. lungs can't keep up right it's never like a smoking is bad ad or anything it's just like yeah. no this is the reality this is what you get for smoking and you know they're going to make fun of you for it because you're lagging behind everyone. <laughs> right. You know, so I, I really enjoyed that as well. Just like it sits in a, in a strange place in the comics market where like, it's not a, it's not a kid's book. It looks cartoony. Mm-hmm. The art is kind of, you know, giving you these cartoony vibes, but like definitely not for anybody. I would say younger than a high school <laughs> student probably, yeah. but also like, you know, for older readers, like it, it definitely has layers you know, upon layers where if you're actually in college reading this at the time, you're like, this is my life. Like, I really do so much of this. <laughs> and if you're older, you're looking back and you're just kind of like, yeah, I, I remember, you know, those feelings and those emotions and like going through, you know, bad breakups or like, you know, going through money problems or, you mm-hmm. know, like the time me and my friends got too drunk, you know, and like stumbled home at 3 a.m. or, you know, all these other things that, you know, you, you can either look back fondly or you can look back and be like, yeah, we were kind of dumb <laughs> <laughs> in college. Usually a mix of both. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But yeah, I just, I found that really refreshing, just the way that a lot of those issues were handled in this, where it's not necessarily, again, done with like a, you know, after school special kind of stuff, because you don't really see, I mean, you know, superheroes, when they do drugs, you know, it's like, venom or like you know yeah. so, i mean it's, it really hasn't been since like speedy you know or even like you know iron man with his alcohol problem that you know that kind of stuff has been brought up you know because you're not going to see i mean like wolverine's going to get drunk at the bar as much as that's possible for him but like uh you know it's never like he's not having fun doing it <laughs> or, yeah you know like i think the most you ever get it is sometimes like the x-men have a night out on the town yeah you know but like Besides of that, you know, it's really just like they're all straight laced, yeah, <laughs> you know, superhero save types. The world. Who, yeah, you know, who are very moral, upstanding people and like would never, you know, like besides, you know, She Hulk, like, you know, nobody's hooking up at Avengers Mansion or 
<laughs> you know, stuff like that. But yeah, it's kind of fun. It's kind of fun to see them, you know, kind of navigating and like succeeding or failing or, you know, kind of learning these lessons, you know, about life, you know, as they kind of go along. Yeah, for me, this is kind of along the lines of a lot of the stuff that Brian Lee O'Malley does mm-hmm. just because it's sort of that slice of life coming of age kind of stuff, you know, like Scott Pilgrim, I read seconds recently. And yeah. this is definitely more along those lines where it's not necessarily for kids, which, you know, like you said, this being a boombox thing, some people might see the art and think, something along the line of Lumberjanes, but yeah. it's like, no, this is like a step up from Lumberjanes, as fun as Lumberjanes is, even, you know, as an adult. Yeah. But, you know, I think I'm really, really glad that I finally made the time to read this because I think you tweeted something about it. And I was like, oh, I need to like go finish that. And I was like, you know what, let me make it a podcast so I yeah. actually get it done. And, you know, Jordan, thank you so much for coming on to talk about it. Is there Any final thoughts you want to run through real quick here? I would say, this is my hot take opinion, I would say I would put Giant Days up against really any comic, Mm -hmm. you know, in terms of like quality and like sustained, I mean, again, think about it, like you said, 54 issues, I love all of them. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> you know, I never read one and was like, mm, all right. <laughs> Off day for yeah. John Allison. Like, that probably wasn't the best. It was like, no, like, they're all excellent and like they all suck you in. Um, you're really involved, you know, with, with their lives and you really are, are rooting for them or just like, Susan, not mm-hmm. again. Like, just come on, get it together. And I, and I think that's a testament, you know, to everybody involved, you know. Uh, from start to finish, because it's not easy, you know, it's not easy to have that kind of sustained run. And it's not easy to not only maintain that level of quality, but like, throughout, you know, keep a book this engaging, this funny, this heartfelt, this sincere, you know, to not kind of verge into, you know, either, because that's the thing with sitcoms, too, is like, sometimes you're just kind of like, oh, we've reached the point where everybody is just like a broad stroke character you say the yeah. you say your catchphrase and like you know you do the wacky thing and like um you know it's just all really over the top and it never really hits that place with giant days like everybody mm-hmm. always feels like from when you first meet them to you know the very end you're just like man like i i i why is this over <laughs> like, yeah. why is there not more after this you kind of feel a little sad after that but like it, it ends in a great way and i think um you know it's one of those runs of comics that I think will, will stand, you know, for forever, you know, like Mm -hmm. it's going to be one of those that people continuously come back to. Um, Sure. You know, some things might be a little bit dated because, you know, it has been around for a while now, but like for the most part, I think a lot of this is just evergreen stuff that, you know, if you've never read it before, it's going to like really jump out at you. But like for us, you know, even going back and reading through a lot of those initial issues, I'm like, fond memories you know what I mean? like, I'm like, yeah. oh man this feels good like it feels good to come back to it it feels comforting to come back to it um and it makes me miss it even more having read through it again yeah i i don't think that's necessarily a hot take because i think this pretty instantly jumped into like my top five and i had talked about my top three comics several years back and i can't remember what the third one was but like the f- top two were definitely like the long halloween and why the last man And it's so hard when you enjoy so many different genres, too. Like, The Long Halloween, very different from Why the Last Man. Mm -hmm. Very, very different from Giant Days. So, like, you have so many different types of comics that you can read that, you know, my top five is probably, like, not remotely the same just because I like so many different things. And, you know, I'm looking at my shelf and I'm like, when was the last time something hit me, like this did. Hmm. And I'm just like, I don't think any of these have had that kind of impact. Like, sure, I've enjoyed Scott Snyder's Batman run. But as much as I love the Court of Owls, I don't think I would put it above Giant Days. So it's just kind of one of those things where you can love something and not necessarily have it be your favorite. Yeah. But at the same time, like you were saying, there's not really a whole lot out there like Giant Days. You know, we kind of mentioned some of the Brian Lee O'Malley stuff, which Mm -hmm. is in a similar vein, but I personally haven't read anything that is like this. Yeah, definitely. And I I think that it goes to show that, one, you know, there's, there's a necessary 
hole now, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, within the space that like, it would be nice to have more books like this, um, out there, whether they're, you know, web comics, like I'm sure there are some, I mean, again, let's start it out as a web comic and like, yeah. John Ellison has done more books, you know, post giant mm-hmm. days. It's not like he stopped making comics. So like, um, you know, they're all quality in that way, but I think there's just something really special about giant days, you know, that a lightning in the bottle, kind of feeling to it where it just like i I don't know if there will be another book that's quite like this that kind of has that kind of because again it's the perfect marriage of you know story and character but also like the art you know it's just so Mm -hmm. on point and like even when they made the transition uh between artists like it didn't feel like whoa this is a jarring change you know from one person to the next yeah (laughs) Um, it was just like, oh, okay, like this is slightly different, yeah, but still very much hitting the same kind of, you know, uh, exaggerated cartoony vibe. And like, I think it's, it's, I, you just can't say enough about, um, how it's just well executed everything is from start to finish. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, I don't know. There's, there's, there's people out there who would, you know, tell you, oh, you know, giant days, that's, I don't know. I don't know what kind of comics they would try to, you know, box it into. But I think that there's such a wide appeal to it that, like, Mm -hmm. you know, even the most hardcore, you know, like, really, uh, you know, closed off comic fan who was just like, ooh, you know, I only read Spawn or, (laughs) you know, whatever. (laughs) Or the people who are like, oh, my favorite comics are The Sandman and Preacher or something like that. Yeah. You know, because I think it kind of crossed over you know like comics kind of feels like you know between the the mainstream and the indie you know crowd where you know you kind of have these lines of divisions where sometimes people are like you know i only read you know i i never read big two books i only read you know these books or like i only read big two books and i'll never read vault (laughs) you can't make me do it or they Uh, only read marvel and not dc and (laughs) yeah or even like i only read manga and i don't read any you Mm -hmm. know american comics it's like i think giant days has something for all of those groups of people who you know like it's just it's so it's just so nice it's just such a nice yeah. book that like you just can't help but feel good after reading it so you know anybody who hasn't like i said there's there's many different ways to grab it to access it hopefully it's still in your comic book shop hopefully they still have these beautiful hardcover editions uh you know you can definitely get them online but like maybe maybe if sales jump up you know they'll they'll print some more of the the hardcovers and finish that out so I can have those nicely on my shelf. Yeah, everyone go read it. Jordan, thank you again for joining me to talk about it and getting me to read the rest of it because it was such a joy. My pleasure. (laughs) 